We're a week into second lockdown over here in the UK and it's fair to say that us knitters and crafters have adapted a few different coping mechanisms for this. There's the diligent few who've managed to squirrel away a few projects that it is that they're super excited to work on and pick one of those up and start making their merry way through that monogamously. There's those of us who perhaps are feeling a little bit more, you know, ill at ease and perhaps struggling to settle on just one thing and so dart between a few different individual projects projects, you know, quickly and in between. And then there's those of us who, um, oh, is that a squirrel? What? Hello there pickles and welcome to episode 48 of the Knitting Vicariously podcast. My name is Caroline, I'm found more commonly as Dunderknit on both Instagram and Ravelry. I'm a knitter living here in South London and if this is your first time joining us here on the podcast, a big hello and welcome to you. Very quick word of warning though, just to let you know to say this is a swearing friendly podcast and therefore the language, it does get a little bit colourful. If that's not your bag, I completely appreciate it. Just wanted to give you a heads up. The good news is there are plenty other knitting and crafting podcasts out there for you to enjoy. But indeed, if knitting and swearing is your bag, then you are very, very much at home here. And a huge welcome back to those of you who come back to join me once again. As I mentioned, we're a little bit over a week into second lockdown over here in the UK and bearing up okay for the most part. Um, from my perspective, there's not a huge amount of change in the day to day. I'm still continuing to work from home, um, but obviously a bit less contact, a bit less seeing people and a bit less general going out and about. I do need to make a better, some more concerted effort to try and get out during the daylight hours. I think the fact that nights are drawing in and it's getting darker so much earlier than it was during first lockdown, I'm definitely starting to feel that. And uh, by the time it gets to the end of the working day, it's been dark for a good few hours by that point. So I need to find a way of getting that vitamin D in there somehow. Luckily, this part of the house where there are the skylights and a few windows around, that does help. It becomes a little sun trap during the day. Um, but yes, I do need to get out and about a little bit more. And speaking of sunshine, I have to say a huge, huge thank you to everybody who commented and left such lovely, lovely words over here on YouTube, uh, who said lovely things over on Instagram, who dropped me a message over on Ravelry, just to let you know that you were delighted to see the podcast coming back. I felt so thoroughly welcomed back into the vlogging and podcasting world. It's fair to say I was away for a little bit longer than I had intended, but um, certainly coming back, you made me feel incredibly, incredibly welcome. Fair to say that it was a, it's a tough one to get back into, just in the sense of I was rusty as all hell. Um, between, I mentioned last time, obviously, with the camera issues and moving between rooms, um, largely part of the reason the batteries ran out is because I had to try so many times to not trip over words and generally make an absolute tit of myself more of a tit of myself than I do under normal duress. So um, so yes, thank you so much for making me feel as though I wasn't quite such a klutz coming back into the podcasting world. Your kind words and general uh, encouragement was very, very much appreciated. You will see that we have stuck with the new podcasting situation at the moment. I know that a lot of you will miss the stash wall. Personally, I do miss it as well. Um, but just being kind of really crammed into that tiny space is a lot. It's also where I spend pretty much every waking moment of the day during the week, so it's quite nice to come into another part of the house and just sit for a little while. Also, it is not fucking it down with rain. It was doing earlier on today and I thought I was gonna have to squeeze into the uh, into the craft room again, but uh, no, good news. We have managed to see a little bit more daylight and, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you like it. We've obviously got a few things that we can bring in to talk about and these are nothing more than, these are a little bit more than just kind of stand-up props. We will be talking about both of these things at some point. So I might try and, you know, brighten up the backdrop and bring some variety into it. But, um, but yeah, fair to say, I'm glad you all like the setup. I will bring in the stash wall as and when I can. 
just before we get started on the knitting and crafting proper, there are two things I want to mention up front this month. The first of those is a bit of a discussion that we've been having over here uh, around making sure that we as a podcast and uh, the community around it are continuing to support causes that matter to us, in particular um, causes along the lines of diversity inclusion within the wider knitting community, Black Lives Matter, accessibility, and uh, of course, more recently, some of the discussions that have come up around the US election. Now, um, I have touched on my opinions there previously. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail here this time around, other than to say, I've been having a little bit of a think about how we continue to support causes on an ongoing basis. In the past, we have um, donated profits from the um, YouTube channel over to the likes of the Momentum Fund, uh, which was a fund that was set up by Neighbourhood Fibre Company. Uh, we've looked at ways of donating to other charities such as the ACLU, such as Liberty here in the UK, both of which are civil rights funds. And I wanted to make sure that I'm making a concerted effort to do that going forward. Now, this is a podcast that's a bit different from some of the others that you may see in the knitting community. Obviously, I don't have a knitting business or a crafting business associated with this channel. This is a channel that's been set up by me and is broadly speaking, um, one of self-interest, I guess, if we want to put it that way. I mean, that makes me sound terribly narcissistic, but there we go. Um, and so as such, I'm in a position where obviously I'm able to make clear my, my views, make clear my values, and um, not have any kind of risk of that impacting my own personal business. Other people are in different situations. I don't choose to impose my, uh, my beliefs, my values on them. That's very much on them. But that being said, I'm also in a position where this is not my primary source of income. Uh, I work full time, sometimes more than that. And um, as such, this is something that I do on the side because I enjoy it. And um, thinking about it a little bit recently, I kind of got to the point where I thought, actually, what I'd really love to do with the podcast is find a way of taking the time that I put into this, whether it's the filming, the editing, so much editing, so much watching myself make mouth noises. Um, how can I find a way to, to use that more positively? So I mentioned over on Instagram that proceeds from this month's podcast were going to go to ACLU over in the US. And I think what I would like to do going forward is take the um, the money that's raised by YouTube advertising revenue, which is not a huge amount, but you know, a, a reasonable um, amount that usually goes towards things like giveaways and prizes and so on that we do for things like the Blame Dungeon It Along. And um, what I would like to do with that going forward is donate portions of that each, uh, each month over to causes that are important to us, that we want to support. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of starting to think this through and, and work it through. It does mean that previously there are kind of pre-roll ads that you can skip at the beginning of the podcast. I'm going to be adding more of those at the end in the means of hopefully maximising our revenue. And the good news is that in order to donate to causes that you hopefully support as well as I do, um, you don't really have to do anything. You just have to, you know, watch the ads and then hopefully off the back of that, we'll see some revenue that we're able to put forward. Um, Certainly where there isn't a kind of prize fund that's coming up, my intention is to donate all of the proceeds from this over to it. So this isn't me kind of trying to uh, find a way of generating more revenue from myself. Thankfully, my day job does more than enough in that space. And so I'm looking forward to being able to effectively donate my time and, uh, and your eyes, creepy, um, <laughs> your attention and general support. Uh, and turn that into something that obviously will hopefully make a difference. So um, yeah, a bit rambly, but uh, I hope you're coming with me on that. If you do have specific funds, charities, causes that are particularly close to your heart, I would love to see those featured down in the comments below. Um, to begin with, I think we'll be looking at civil liberties and civil rights charities, particularly those that support causes and um, further diversity and inclusion agendas, as well as um, access rights and so on and so forth. But um, if you do have any other that are particularly close to your heart, I'd love to hear about them. Please do feel free to pop those in the comments below. And then the second thing to mention up front is, of course, our eponymous Blame Dunder Knit Along. Yes, it's back. I talked about it last time round. We will be hearing a fair bit more about it later on in this week's podcast. But just a mention up front to let you know that if you have been struggling to perhaps feel truly kind of 
invested or engaged with something, or if you're admired in obligation knitting and desperately looking for a way out, I am here to help you. Yes, indeed, I will take full blame and full accountability for you casting on or picking up projects with wanton abandon. Yes, indeed, this means that you can go out of your way and really just take my name in vain. If that means going out and treating yourself to a purchase of a pattern or some yarn, if that's something you're able to afford, or indeed if it's just the accountability uh, withheld from you from going out and plundering the stash for something that you really have no business in casting on, I am here to take that burden for you. So yes, we have the knit along, which is essentially a make along. You can sew, you can crochet, you can embroider, you can do whatever you like as part of this. This is all about bringing you joy and relinquishing yourselves of any accountability. That make along runs from the 1st of November, so earlier on this month, all the way through to the end of January, the 31st of January. There is no obligation to finish, there's no obligation to work on any specific thing. There there are really very few obligations whatsoever, which is exactly the way that I like it. So as part of that, um, I did get a couple of questions. One of those was, are you allowing whips? And while I haven't in previous years, the whole thing was, no, 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 you have to go out and gleefully cast something new on. I am conscious that 2020 has been quite the year. And so as part of that, if you've cast something on and it's brought you joy and you just put it to one side because it's not really been something that you've kind of felt like working on at that point in time, or, you know, you just really want to get back into something, do you know what? Fuck it. 2020 can do one. As far as I'm concerned, you knit on whatever you like, you sew, you crochet, you embroider whatever you like. As long as it brings you joy and you're happy to talk about it, then I am definitely here for it. So you crack on. Alrighty, I think we're good. So as ever, you'll be able to find show notes for this week's episode. I'll include them in the description box below. That's going to be your primary place to get hold of them if you are watching this over on YouTube. If you do happen to be watching this on Ravelry, you will be able to take a look at the show notes that are hosted in our Ravelry group. We have the Knitting Vicariously podcast group on Ravelry. You can find that by searching over in the groups tab. I am conscious, however, that not everyone is necessarily using Ravelry. And so as such, you'll also be able to find show notes for this week's episode over on Instagram, where I have the inst oh, the Instagram account, where I have the Knitting Vicariously Instagram account in addition to my own. And in that Knitting Vicariously account, you will find one post per episode that includes hashtags and relevant links to makers in there as well to support your just Insta stalking and all the like. But yes, with no further ado, let's get into it. And the first thing to tell you about is what I'm wearing. This is an old favourite. It is fair to say this is possibly the knit that gets the most wear. And I'm as shocked as anyone to say that because um, I didn't really think I was into knitted cardigans. And yet here we are. This is my farmhouse cardigan. It's a pattern by Amy Christoffers. I'll include her pattern picture up here on the screen. And this is a cardigan that I knit for Rhinebeck 2019. Uh, it was a pattern chosen by a wonderful and very dear friend of mine who is Connie, and if she's watching, wah, um, and to every one of those of uh, us in the immediate group who also knit farmhouses, I hope you have been enjoying yours and been able to get a huge amount of wear out of it. Um, as I say, I'm kind of surprised how much I wear this thing. This is particularly now that I'm spending pretty much all my time at home. Uh, this is great for just kind of chucking on and padding about the house. It's essentially like a woolly dressing gown, um, which doesn't sound like the most flattering of items, but here we are. Uh, so yes, I knit this out of um, Cascade Eco Wool or Cascade Eco Plus, I believe, in the spruce colourway. And... Um, I will, I will stand up and show you the, um, the cardigan itself. I do suggest that you go back and look at the episode where I featured this. I want to say it would be round about September, October last year. I will include which episode it is in the pattern, in the pattern, in the description box below, in the show notes. Um, one thing I do want to say though is when it comes to the yarn, so Cascade, no, I have some feelings about anyway as a yarn company, but in terms of the yarn itself, this is yarn that I would describe as um, path yarn, path, uh, which is to say this yarn is pilly as fuck. 
<laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm wearing this a lot, and as such, it's getting a fair bit of wear, but it's also saying that, goodness gracious, there's a lot of pilling that goes on. I do have a little electric depiller. Uh, it is a wonderfully terrifying sort of thing that scares the cat every time I use it, um, but it does manage to, you know, yin, 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 yin. Um, whatever that noise was, uh, it manages to, you know, just get rid of the kind of the surface pills. I do also have a gleaner. Um, I have, if there is pill removal technology out there, I can promise you I probably own it. But um, yeah, this still needs to be treated on a fairly regular basis. It could be something to do with the fact it's knit at a relatively loose gauge. I feel like most of this was knit on size five and a half, six millimeter needles, which would be a US size nine-ish, maybe. So that's a four, five, uh, so that's a six, seven, an eight, a nine or a 10, I think, I think. But um, but yeah, it is a, a sort of Aaron to bulky weight yarn. So, you know, in theory it works. Um, but yeah, let me stand up and give you a very, very quick shot of it there. There you go. Customary boob shot, of course, and you can see here the texture of the cardigan itself, along with the aforementioned pills. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of it going on here, but there is some nice texture on either side, as you can see. Um, I've got, oops, we're a bit up close and personal today, aren't we? Um, you can see here we've got some nice rag on shoulder seams going on. It is textured on both the front and the back. And we've got, oopsie, sorry about that, there we go. Um, we've got the knit button band, which is knit at the same time, which is why I like it. And frankly, the tiniest and least practical pockets in the land. Even to put a phone in here, the top half of it is out. So, you know, yeah, tiny pockets. Pockets, yes. Tiny, tiny pockets. There we go. So, um, yeah, here you have it. My farmhouse cardigan. No buttons, because that's the way I roll. Yeah, sorry, that was a bit up close and personal for that one, but I didn't want to move the camera back because I've got a whole setup and just, if you want to see it properly, I would recommend that you pop back over to that previous episode. And as I say, I'll include a link to that in the description box below. But yeah, that's what I'm wearing this week. And um, the good news is I've got a finished object to share. I know, I know, it's very exciting. And you're looking at me and you're like, Caroline, did you get, did you get one of the sweaters that you were working on last week finished? Because... You, you know, you just just got past the arms on both of those and, you know, with a really, really concerted effort, you probably could have got at least one of those finished by now. And I'm going to turn around to you and I'm going to go, dear viewer, <laughs> the fuck are you talking about? No, of course I didn't. Um, instead, what I decided to do, because, <laughs> you know, obviously, uh, what I decided to do was to knit a sweater for um, my friend's baby. Now, those of you who've been around the podcast for a little while will know and I have knit a few things recently in tiny person form for the aforementioned tiny person. Um, partly because she's fairly adorable and partly because her mum is a very, very good friend of mine. And so uh, a few different things have been knit. We did a little flax light, which was a beautiful little kind of neutral coloured baby sweater. Um, we've done a couple of little hats now. Uh, we did a cardigan. That was very cute. Uh, we're not going to talk about the teddy bear thing, so you know we're, we're not going to we're not going to talk about that. Just going to say that not going to talk about it. Um, it'll get done at some point, right? Yeah, I know it's probably now going to be too small. I'm going to have to rip it out, and that yarn's going to be an absolute bastard to rip out, and we're all going to regret everything that's ever happened ever. But not talking about it. So instead, hmm, what I thought I would do was that I would knit her a sweater, a colorwork sweater, because. As we've established, autumn is the time for the colorwork sweaters. And uh, as we've also established, the attention span that I have at the moment is limited. So here you have it. Look at this little cutie. Look at it. Um, this is the Moraine sweater. It is a pattern by Tin Can Knits, and I'm going to include their pattern picture here. And then I'm going to explain. So. <laughs> As you can see, theirs is a beautiful, beautiful sweater. It's a tin can knits pattern and therefore the sizing on this is pretty excellent. It goes all the way from the tiniest of newborn babies up to a really reasonable size for an adult. I believe the largest size is about 58 and a half inches uh, in terms of the chest measurement there. And um, 
Yes, so it is fair to say that I modified this a little bit. I was definitely feeling the need for a kind of an autumnal uh, colourwork knit, clearly that is where my head is at at the moment, but in terms of uh, an adult size fitting garment, I mean I'm knitting on my laurel, I love my laurel, I'm super excited about my laurel, I wanted something quicker because I was feeling impatient. So um, I didn't, however, want to faff around with the um, additional kind of flea stitches, I think they're called the kind of the little one speckle stitches uh, the whole way through the rest of the um, the sweater. And likewise, I didn't want to faff around too much with any kind of color panels here at the bottom or on the sleeves, largely because couldn't be fucked, but also because I do always worry about the kind of tautness, if you like, of the tension that you're going to get there in the sense that that then might be the thing that they struggle to get over the top of, uh, you know, nappies in particular or um, anything that they happen to be wearing. So I thought I would I would lust away and happily knit out the top colour work here and then leave off some of the detail on the rest. But I am going to hold it up to the camera so you can see it properly. So here you have it. You've got my colour work there. We have some very fun colours. I think this was kind of inspired by a few different things. I mean, all of these were leftovers that were sitting in my stash. The main colour here is actually ooh, wildly blown out on the camera. Let me pull it back a little bit here so you can actually see. Yeah, because I'm not that ghostly. I mean, I'm fairly ghostly, but not quite that ghostly. This is a better representation of the kind of green that it is. It's darker than the green that I'm wearing in my cardigan and certainly more of a uh, a kind of true dark emerald than it is the kind of slightly teal green that I've got in my cardigan. But this is very, very deep stash. So this colour here is Marshland in uh, Madeline Tosh DK, I think, rather than DK Twist. This is yarn that I've had since about 2012, I believe. Um, I'm fairly certain it was a purchase from my mum when she went over to the US and visited over there at one point. Uh, it's also just starting to rain, so apologies if you're going to get some background tapping there. I promise it's no one trying to get in. It's just the rain on the skylights at the top. But um, but yeah, so that's the main colour itself here. And then the contrast colours, you may recognise one if not both of these if you've been watching the podcast for a little while. The greenish yellow that we've got in here is Plucky Cozy in their Ogre colourway. This is a yarn I used to knit an Ellery sweater, which is a pattern by Jen Emerson. I wore that to Ryan back, back in 2018, uh, along with a few of my friends who made the same pattern. But it's a fantastic kind of really, really kick you in the face blue, uh, sort of blue, uh, kind of yellowy green colour. It's a fab. And then this mint colour here is Yes, indeed. It is the truly, truly ill-fated Malabriga Rios um, in the water green colourway. And the reason that it's ill-fated is because most of the yarn that I had uh, for this colourway here made its way into a worsted boxy by Hohi Locatelli, um, which is definitely one of my biggest knitting fails. Um, mint green is not for me. I love it. It does not love me. And for all that you as an audience were you know, very politely split on the matter, I cast the deciding vote and that deciding vote was a no. Uh, <laughs> so here we go. Hopefully um, this little girl will love it a lot more than I did um, in terms of just, you know, it just it, it doesn't quite work with the red, but it's fine. It's fine. So um, yes, this is Moraine. I knit the 12 to 18 month size for her. She herself is, I believe, just on nine months now. Um, but obviously we know that babies don't always adhere uh, particularly well to the sizing that is roughly in line with their age range. So I'm hopeful that I'll be able to get this over to her mum in the not too distant future. And um, it'll be something that's able to keep her cosy over the colder months in lieu of a um, teddy, teddy bear onesie. What? Hmm? Hmm? Oh, that's that squirrel back again. That's handy. Last but very not least, um, needles on this. So I use the recommended needle size, which is a 3.75 millimeter for all the ribbing and then a five millimeter for the body of the sweater itself. Um, I don't go up uh, any needle sizes for my color work. Um, I have over the years managed to kind of adapt my working, my, my, uh, the way that I work color work stitching 
to um, be relatively even in terms of my tension. I do two-handed colour work, so I will have the contrasting colour, which I want to be the slightly more dominant colour, I'll hold that in my left hand, and then my main colour I will hold in my right hand. I knit right-handed, I knit kind of somewhere between um, flicking and kind of standard English style. I don't drop the yarn at any point, but I also don't hold um, my yarn kind of consistently with my index finger. I tend to sort of flick it round and then put my finger back on the needle itself, if that makes any sense. So um, yeah, between those two, my sort of my tension's relatively even, which means I don't have to go up a needle size. However, if you are finding that your tension with colour work is particularly tight, then going up a needle size for that section can sometimes help you. So um, yeah, just in case. But yeah, so US size, it'll be a five for the for the ribbing itself and then it would be a US size eight for the main body of the rest of the sweater. But that is my finished object for this week. It has been living very, very happily over here in uh, one of my favorite knitting bags, my knitting project bag. This is a bag by Sugar Tots, who is the maker of the most wonderful bags with the most incredible fabric. This one in particular is one of my absolute favorites because it has space otters on it. What is not to love? Uh, it's also fair to say I did coordinate this slightly uh, with my bag, with my project rather, because obviously a sort of blue-green-green green background with some of the little yellow-green highlights. I mean, it felt like it needed to happen, but also, as I say, I, do, I really do love this bag. I've still got all my leftover yarn in here, because um, obviously I've got a fair few bits and pieces, so we've got... That's the rest of the marshland there. Is it marshland or is it moorland? Oh, no, there's a question. I think it might actually be called moorland, this yarn. Oh, I tell you what. So this, this is my little top tip to myself for stash yarns. I, when I wind the cake, I then fold up the little yarn tag and leave it in the center. Um, so here we go. It's called moorland, there we go. That's helpful. I also fold it in such a way that I can see the colorway fairly easily and then proceed to ignore it and talk to you about yarn colorways that I've made up because, sure, why not? I've got the plucky cozy over here and I've got a little bit of the watery green because this is the yarn that will not die. <laughs> I've still got so much of this fucking stuff, honestly. But uh, but yeah, quite love these two together. And then it was a question as to whether I went gray or whether I went green and uh, that was where we ended up. So um, yeah, there we go. Yarns for the Moraine sweater. Moorland, Marshland, Moorland, Moorland. So yeah, that is the main thing I've been working on this week to have a finished object in terms of works in progress. I have been continuing to work on my tulip sweater. I will hold it up. This is a pattern by Melody Hoffman, who is B Mandarines. Her pattern picture is here for you to enjoy. And to be honest, if you want to hear me talk about it, I would recommend that you pop back over to the previous episode number 47, because in reality, the amount that I've managed to do in the interim does not really justify my spending too much time talking about it here. Um, previously when I showed it to you, I think I was about here, so I've put maybe, maybe three inches on it. Um, I didn't do anything quite so helpful as to keep my progress keeper in the same place. Uh, I moved that part way through the week because I was being clever and did not think about it. Um, but I will, of course, just showcase my little progress keeper because it's a cute one. Yeah, this is my little beaded progress keeper and it is a fabulous little waving cat. Uh, and this is by The Corner of Craft who does a fabulous line in all of these little stitch markers. But yeah, Tulip Jumper is still a work in progress. As I mentioned previously, this yarn is, again, stash yarn. It is Madeline Tosh Merino DK, which is their single ply in the Kenobi colorway. Someone last week was asking me what our options to get hold of this yarn in the UK. Honestly, I'm not completely sure. So Tosh Merino DK was stocked, the single ply was stocked in quite a few of the local yarn stores over here. I know that Loop in London had it at one point, um, but I believe it was discontinued um, from general yarn stores. I may be completely wrong, but I certainly haven't seen it quite so frequently uh, in, in recent years. In terms of getting hold of it, I would say your best bet is probably going to be D stashes at this point, um, unless you can do some good, strong Googling work uh, and find it somewhere. But yeah, from my perspective, I think I bought this from the US 
Um, and actually, yes, so I got this from the Madeleine Tosh web store and it would have been just before Rhinebeck in 2018 because this was one of the yarns that my wonderful friend Meredith had agreed to get shipped to her and then when we met up for the first time in New York we then did a big old trade of US yarns that I'd had shipped to her and UK yarns that um, I then had sh that she then had shipped to me and uh, it meant that before I even got to Rhinebeck I already had a fairly you know, healthy haul at that point. So, so this was a yarn that I got then. In terms of more recently and in terms of UK, I'm not totally sure. These stashes are always a good place to start, but Google is definitely your friend. So yeah, I won't spend too much more time talking about it. Folded neckband being the main adjustment that I've made. I will continue to do a little bit more work on the body. I'm probably gonna get it to hip, hip me sort of high to mid hip. It's got a beautiful scalloped hem, as you probably remember. And then I will do what I can with the yarn I have remaining for the sleeves and just kind of see how we get on. But hopefully I'll have a bit more of a dent in this one next time round. In terms of other works in progress, I showed you my laurel sweater last time round. I am super excited about it. So excited that I've done nothing with it for the last two weeks. So yeah, but you know, still super excited. Glad to hear that you love the pattern. Excited to see there are some of you that have cast it on for the blame dundered it along. Super excited about that. But yes, I will be getting back to that in the very, very near future, I promise. But I did mention up front that I've had a bit of an attack of the squirrels recently. And just to, to attack of the squirrels sounds like a tremendous name. <laughs> it's like Planet of the Apes, attack of the squirrels. It's a bit more of a kind of British one. You'd have Simon Pegg in it and you'd be sort of beating something off with a cricket bat. Anyway, that got a bit violent. Um, in terms of my general attention span over the last few weeks, I think going back into lockdown, nights getting darker, I've definitely been in need of something that was fairly soothing. And as such, hopefully there's a few of you that have clocked and started to um, take a little look at this kit here behind me. This is one of the numerous amazing map kits um, that have been created and are sold by a lady called Hannah Bass. She has these fantastic map tapestry kits that are available from a series of different places. So ordinarily in years, she'd be doing a lot of the big kind of crafting shows. I know she's been at the um, knitting, uh, is it the knitting crafting fair? Um, that generally kind of covers a lot of the main ex exhibition centres over here in the UK. Um, I've seen her at quite a few of the kind of smaller, more indie fairs, um, but the main way to obviously keep in touch with her is over on her website, which while in, I will include here uh, in the box here below and obviously in the description notes as well. And um, she is someone who, as I say, really, really, truly inspired. She does a lot with tapestries. I'll come on to exactly what that is because you'd be forgiven for thinking this is cross stitch. I do not have the patience for cross stitch. I am absolutely in awe of all of you out there, particularly um, it's Lady Wing Designs that I follow over on Instagram and I've watched some of her episodes on YouTube as well. Definitely worth a look. Someone who is, I mean, an amazing crafter all round, but in terms of her cross stitch in particular, really does some properly incredible work. But um, but yes, I digress. Um, anybody who's ever been to my house, and there may be a couple of you watching here, but probably not the majority, because that would be creepy and stalkerish, um, you will probably have noticed that I have a bit of an affinity with maps. Pretty much every bit of artwork or kind of framed work up on my wall is likely to be a map of some sort. Um, I put that down to a few things, most notably the fact that my mother, who will be watching this, hello mum, when I was very young was a geography teacher for many years and so we had maps in our house, I was fairly readily surrounded with them, but I think it's probably fair to say that as um, uh, as, an, as an only child of a single parent at that point, I, I was taught to map read fairly early on and I definitely have a bit of a fascination with maps generally. If I'm going somewhere new, I love to go and explore and kind of take a look at the place um, just to get a feel for it by looking at the map. I know that my mum has um, explored in slight air quotes, a lot of parts in the world um, by using Google Earth and Google Maps and more readily has managed to kind of find out about places that I've mentioned in passing by then going and investigating them properly to the point where she'll ask me questions about, oh, what about the place that's opposite? Is that still selling this? And they're going, I haven't even seen this place. What are you talking about? 
witchcraft. But, um, but yes, a bit of an obsession with maps, it's fair to say. So when I came across these a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was actually a really good friend of mine who is Max. Uh, she is Nitiam over on Instagram. Definitely recommend you going and taking a look at her feed because she's got a few of these that she's finished and my god, they look amazing. Pretty sure she showcased these to me at one point and I just lost my tiny little mind. So let me bring this one over so you can take a proper look. So yeah, as I mentioned, this is a tapestry kit. So rather than a cross stitch, what you're doing here is a half stitch the whole way along. So it's knit with wool rather than with uh, incredibly fine thread. And as such, it's a bit easier and rather quicker to get through. Now, obviously this is a fairly sizable piece. It's, um, it's on a frame here, but actually you can see that it's a fairly sizable piece. Um, a lot of these I've seen turned into really nice kind of 50 by 50 size cushions and um, Really love that idea, definitely keen to, to turn this into a cushion at some point, but um, it's fair to say that the London map, being as this is currently my hometown, it has been for a good few years now, definitely felt like the most appropriate one. And she has a few different versions of this. She has a multicoloured one with London across the centre, uh, and then she's got obviously this version in various different shades of grey, which you'll be able to see here. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love this, particularly seeing as it has all of our tube lines as well, kind of intersecting the place. So this is a project that I started, oh good lord, this is going to be depressing, maybe 2017, maybe? This is not, I have not done all of this in two weeks, because <laughs> no. Um, but this is a project I started quite a long while ago, and what tends to happen, a bit like my crochet blanket, is that every now and again I just kind of go, tapestry kit. Uh, I get it out, I work on it for a bit, and it goes back into hibernation. So I am not expecting that you will see this through to completion because that doesn't feel like me. But I am firmly putting this in the camp of blame under knit along, which is to say I should have been working on my tulip sweater. I definitely should have been working on my laurel sweater. But about halfway through last week I went, oh bollocks to it, I'm gonna get this out, I quite fancy it. And I've been really enjoying it. Um, I have managed to do a little bit here of the river. I've managed to do a little bit down here. I've got a park done. I've got a little bit more of a park and a bit more of the river. Um, I did that little garden bit late last night. So, you know, there's quite a few bits coming on. I will actually sit forward so you can see it properly. So yeah, I'm conscious that up close it probably looks far less impressive than it did from further away because you can see just how much of it is done versus not done. So obviously there's a good few roads that I've managed, oh hello, there we go. Good few roads that I've managed to get filled in here. The fact that some of these roads are obviously quite thin is um, a little bit fiddly. There are a number of different maps that she does of particularly American cities where a lot of them are based on grid systems. They look a little bit easier to do because obviously grid systems, quite a bit simpler to kind of complete a bit of a grid um, as opposed to this mess in here, which is Westminster, uh, which is a little bit fiddlier to work through. But um, but yeah, as I say, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not someone who kind of goes, I will get all of this bit done and then I shall move on. I'm someone who goes, I will work with white today because I feel like it. So, you know, logic is a strong point with me and practicality. Um, but yeah, I've been working through this and have been really, really enjoying it. The frame, because I'm sure some people will ask, is one that I actually picked up on her website. It is an Elbacy. Um, and it, I believe there's a stand that can come with this as well. As it happens, I have been leaning this on the side of a sofa and um, tend to sort of prop it like this. I'll have one arm on top and one arm underneath, kind of pulling the stitching up and then pulling the stitch out and down underneath. Um, again, I am sure there are far, far better ways of doing this. I am not an expert. I am very much a casual hobbyist, if we can, if we can call it that. But Beyond that, I can take absolutely no credit for this. This is a kit. It comes with all of the different yarns in there. She does do options on her website where she says she will sell you the um, canvas itself. And then uh, the, you're obviously at liberty to use whatever uh, wool or yarns that you choose with it. Um, but the canvases themselves, they come with everything. They come with needles. They come with, obviously, the printed canvas and with all of the wool that's needed. Um, and it's fairly generous as well. I certainly don't have any concerns about running out of any of the, the colours that are coming with this. So, 
yeah, if you are in the mood for something along these lines, or indeed you know someone for whom this might be a perfect gift, obviously holiday shipping timings are going to be a little bit up in the air this year, but um, definitely something that it might be worth taking a quick look at. So um, I've really been enjoying this. I do have an Edinburgh one as well, because my hometown, uh, which my mum very kindly gifted to me for Christmas a few years ago, and I've been eyeing up the Berlin one and the New York one as well because they're both cities that I lived in and it feels like something that would be, you know, really, really kind of nice and appropriate. I have, however, said to myself that under no circumstances am I allowed to buy them until I have finished at least one of the other two. So hopefully in five years she'll still be selling them and we'll see how we go. And so moving along into vicarious knitting, as you might imagine, given the squirrely sort of mood that I'm in at the moment, vicarious knitting is a definite strong point. I'm seeing all sorts of patterns and collections at the moment that are definitely teeing up my interest. The first of those this week is part of a collection that launched very, very recently, and I'm super excited to see it. And small spoiler alert, it may feature in the blamed under knit long prize package. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's how excited I am about it. But this is a collection of patterns by Mina Philip and these are a series of cowls. Mina has developed a beautiful range of cowl patterns uh, for a couple of different reasons. The first of those is celebrating her Persian heritage and in particular some of the patterns, some of the colour combinations and choices that come from um, some of the beautiful textiles that um, feature so, so heavily in her and her family's background and as part of that as well it also allows her to showcase the methodology that she's kind of developed and talks about which is um, working at any gauge so within her pattern she can help you make use of whatever yarn you have that you're wanting to, to work with for these cowls and you'll be able to produce a finished object that takes that into account and is sized accordingly so between those two things and the fact that these are a beautiful series of cowls I was very, very excited to take a look. The particular pattern that caught my eye is this one shown here, which is the evil eye. And uh, again, love the pattern in this one here. While it is knit in fingering weight, as I mentioned, Mina has a technique that, mean, that means you can make use of whatever different yarn you have available and you want to use for this. But um, as I say, all of the colour work patterns in this book are really, really lovely and I think for the most part they're all two colour colour work patterns, apologies, the rain is starting a little bit now so you're definitely going to hear that in the background. Hopefully I'm going for soothing rather than deeply annoying. But um, but yeah, so there's some really, really gorgeous two colour colour work patterns um, but this one really did stick out to me. There's a fantastic point at which the dominant colour changes so it moves from being kind of very, very strong. I'll see if I can include that particular picture here. Uh, from very, very strong main colour to um, then the, the stronger dominant colour that starts to come through. So again, I just really love the interplay there, the shift between the two. And uh, this is definitely something that I would love to pull out. I think it could be such a versatile cowl, uh, depending on the pattern, uh, pattern depending on the colours that you choose, and obviously what you're looking to wear it with. So by which I mean probably probably at least one grey in there <laughs> for me personally. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there for whom, you know, pink is a neutral. I'm here for it. I'm absolutely here for that. Do not think that is me giving you any kind of shit at all. If pink is your neutral, then more power to you. Mine is, of course, somewhere between grey and the just constant gold. <laughs> oh, grey and gold. That'd be good. <laughs> So yes, absolutely in love with that set of patterns there. The second thing that caught my eye this week, and this is a pattern that's been around for a very, very long time, comes with a bit of a story attached to it. And there is a very strong chance that I may have worked on a version of this or something that includes this in the next episode. So I'm not going to go into it there. Consider that a small teaser. And if I don't have anything done on it, then let's all forget about it and move on. <laughs> But what I'm talking about here is, again, it's a little collection of patterns by Tiny Owl Knits, and this is the Woodsy Association. I'm going to include her pattern picture here, and then pause for a moment while we all collectively go, oh, yeah, see, told you. Told you. Um, yeah, this is a collection of um, charts patterns that have been worked onto little fingerless mitts. And as you can tell, there's a series of different characters that makes me feel very like 
animals of farthing wood, bright eyes, kind of, it's all just adorable, isn't it? <laughs> so <laughs> the good news is in all of this that the, the patterns that she has, the charts that are available, I believe for the most part, she's actually used duplicate stitching rather than color work. So if you choose to, you could look to try and do some intarsia on there. Might see if I can try some of that. Might be biting off more than I can chew, but um, we'll see how that goes. But uh, if you choose to, you can work up the mitts completely as you like and then duplicate stitch using the charts provided over the top and end up with these frankly adorably cute little woodland mitt creatures. Um, just, just adorable. I imagine as well that with the charts they can probably be used to fit a series of different sizes for the wrist warmers themselves. So if you wanted to make Christmas mitts potentially, if you were that way inclined, these could be some really nice little gift mitts for somebody that adores tiny woodland creatures, which is essentially everybody, right? Right? Everyone like Everyone likes them. Are there squirrel ones? I don't think there are squirrel ones. Are there squirrel ones? No, there are no squirrel ones. That's probably for the best because let's face it, I don't need any more encouragement. <laughs> But yeah, so you can find these over on the Knit Picks website. A lot of them are knit with Knit Picks Palette yarn, which is a really, really affordable, fairly budget-friendly yarn. And obviously, given there are multiple colours in the mitts themselves, probably quite economical in terms of projects as well. If you chose the right colour palette, I imagine you could probably squeeze out a few different versions of the charts and the creatures themselves on different uh, fingerless mitts accordingly. So um, definitely worth a quick look there. Okay, I had to pause briefly because we had something of a downpour here at the moment. It was really difficult for you to hear the tiniest word that I was saying, but cracking on and doing this as best I can in the time that I have, because I think it's gonna get really, really rainy again, not too distant future. Um, clearly, I have color work on the brain at the moment because the other pattern that caught my eye this week was not only color work, but dare I also say a festive sweater. Yes, I know. Now, this is not to say I have ambitions in this space. Heaven knows I can barely find and muster up enough ambition to finish the things that I'm working on at the moment, let alone set myself a deadline of the holiday period for a holiday sweater. That is going to be a step too far, I suspect. However, it doesn't stop me from lusting over this beauty. This is the one that I'm going to try and pronounce my finish is non-existent and I couldn't find any kind of pronunciation record of this over on the website. So, um, Solaulu? Sulaulu? I mean, I apologise for anyone that I've just offended in Finnish. But this is the Solaulu sweater by Jenna Kay. Apologies. As I say, if I knew how to pronounce it, I would make a concerted effort. As it is, I am best guessing my little socks off. Um, but you can see here, it is a beautiful sweater. It's fingering weight, it's knit from the bottom up, it's knit with drop sleeves, and so you'd be knitting it in the round from the bottom up and then being able to pick up stitches and go downwards. And as you can see, it's just a really, really lovely pattern. It's a nice version of colour work as well because you don't have too much stress about it fitting as long as you've got sufficient ease around you, around your midriff, which is somewhere I'm definitely enjoying having a fair bit of ease at the moment, then um, obviously the rest of it as it's a drop shoulder pattern could be fairly kind of loosely fitting and quite kind of you know, just nice and cosy, perfect. For all that it's a fingering weight sweater, depending on the yarn that you choose, you can make this pretty gosh darn cosy. I can imagine this working up really nicely in something like Tuku wool or um, Rauma PT2, for instance, something that's perhaps got a little bit of kind of woolly wool to it. But at the same time, I can see it working really nicely with sock yarn that you have around, albeit potentially a little bit more kind of layering piece rather than fully, fully snuggly cosy. But um, yeah, really, really beautiful pattern. Good sizing as well on this pattern. You're looking at a range from just over a 34 inch bust to just over a 73 inch bust. Now remember, this is something with positive ease, so I'd expect there to be a bit of leeway there in terms of the measurements. But again, a really nice size inclusive pattern. And if you do fancy a challenge, perhaps one that you might be able to get ready in the next six weeks ahead of the holiday season and all of its just weirdness this year I suspect we'll see how that works out but um but yeah definitely something it's worth taking a look at if you're in the market for something to show off your festive feeling 
But that is not all of the inspiration that I'm serving up for you this time around. No, indeed, because the Blame Dungeon It Along is my very favourite source of inspiration. It's one of the reasons that I love this make along so much is that I get the opportunity not only to go and nosy in on a few different things that people are working on, but also take the chance to share those with you and see just the exponential sharing of inspiration and vicarious joy through the community as we are able just to frankly letch on to what other people are working on and start thinking about how lovely that looks. So I get the opportunity to share that with you this time round and so as some of you will be no doubt delighted to hear it is the return of the calorie. There you have it, a slightly different look and feel this time around. I'm trying to just polish things up a little bit with my editing and uh, generally make it a little bit more, you know, kind of a, of a lovely way to showcase people's um, just amazing, incredible works in progress. And so, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed that. If you would like your um, snaps to be featured, either feel free to tag us in the Blame Dungeon It Along hashtag that exists over on Instagram, apologies, rain starting again. Um, as mentioned previously, if you could please capitalize the B in blame, the D in Dundonit, and the A in along, that would be brilliant because it will help people with screen readers be able to decipher that particular hashtag. Also, for those of you who have private accounts, I believe the option is if you tag me in there, so my Dundonit account, my personal account, um, that should appear in my feed and hopefully it means that I should be able to see that. Assuming you're happy with me sharing those pictures publicly here on the, um, the YouTubes, the, <laughs> the podcast, I will happily look to include some of those where I can. And then, of course, the other way to share those is over on Ravelry, where we have the Blame Dungeon It Long chatter thread. You can also post pictures in there of your works in progress, your finished objects, and indeed things that you're looking to start working on. As ever, I would ask that obviously the, uh, the pictures that you post include only your own intellectual property. So if there are charts or anything that you're not including those uh, where they're paid for patterns. And of course, as I mentioned beforehand, you do have the opportunity to win prizes this time round. I'll be drawing two 
two random winners from each of the two areas, two from Instagram and two from Ravelry. We don't have a finished object thread this time round, there's only the two options, um, and so hopefully you've got the opportunity to dip your toe in one or both of those. But given that the skies have clouded over here, the rain has started, and it doesn't look as though it's gonna be finishing anytime soon, I think I will leave it there for this week. As ever, thank you so, so much for joining me. I really hope you've enjoyed my slightly more diverted and, um, you know, distracted <laughs> podcast this week. Certainly not quite the standard knitting fair that you've come to know and enjoy, but it's reflective of my mental state, which at the moment can best be described as the attack of the squirrels. So, <laughs> so there we have it. But um, wherever you are, whatever you're up to, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you, your family are safe, healthy and well, and that that continues to be the case. And so I wish you a wonderful rest of day, rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled. And if for whatever reason it isn't, I hope you have the opportunity to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on and I will see you all again very, very soon. Bye. Perhaps like to pick and choose and maybe move but you move 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 but do but do do that. Good. Super. That I have colour work on the brain at the moment. Colour work squirrels of all things. Uh, no, not actual colour work squirrels. I'm sure there are some seriously Caroline. Um so yes, there are ones oh. out there, but the one that has caught my attention, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the rain is getting really bad. Oh no. I think what I'm realising in this whole kind of attack of the squirrels thing is perhaps not a temporary mental state after all. I think I might actually just be really recognising something that's fairly thoroughly bedded in. <laughs> yeah, I, if nothing else, I'm expecting my epitaph to be, here be squirrels. <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, she was happy. She saw many squirrels. She chased some of them. Hmm, that was fine. Until it wasn't. <laughs> That's what'll land me in trouble in the end. Oh, good Lord. This rain will never, ever stop, will it? No, we'll just have to crackle. <laughs>